Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Sister Helen Prejean, founder of the Ministry Against the Death Penalty. She gives talks across the U.S. and internationally to teach people about the realities of the death penalty and to encourage people to educate themselves on the issue. Sister Helen is the author of Dead Man Walking, the eyewitness account of the death penalty that sparked a national debate, The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions, and River of Fire, My Spiritual Journey. On October 27th, 2022, Sister Helen will give a talk at the University of Oregon as a guest of the UO's Prison Education Program. Thanks, Sister Helen, so much for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Happy to be here. So tell us first about your background. Where are you from? Louisiana. Maybe you can pick it up in my accent. Um, been here all of my life, actually. And um, grew up in Baton Rouge, then moved to New Orleans when I joined the Sisterhood as a young bride of Christ at the age of 18 and been growing ever since. Vatican II happened in the Catholic Church and we moved from women that dressed in medieval garb to thinking, self-directed, community-based women uh, engage with the world to try to help humanity and mercy and justice flower. So what inspired you to join the Sisters of St. Joseph as an 18-year-old? That our Sisters of St. Joseph, I went to St. Joseph Academy, were great teachers. And my mind came alive and also my gifts. I learned to do public speaking when I was, by the time I was a junior in high school, I used it every day of my life. And it was in a women's environment uh, strong women role models. We were taught to use our minds. We were also taught, and we had models, to live out of a deep spirituality or faith. So the nuns were fantastic. So I joined them, and I haven't regretted it. Been riding the wave ever since. So how did you get involved with the movement to abolish the death penalty? Therein hangs a tale or 400 tales. But I tell about this in River of Fire, and it was about waking up at a spiritual dimension in my life in terms of faith in the gospel of Jesus, that following the way of Jesus was more than just being charitable to people and praying for poor people, but staying removed from them out in the suburbs, white privilege, everything in there, um, and waking up to justice. So I'm, I live in New Orleans. 50% of our city of New Orleans, African-American people struggling against poverty and racism, all the way back, complete legacy, straight out of slavery in Louisiana, which had a whole lot of slaves. And the legacy of slavery is played out in every single institution we have, especially the penal system, Angola, where slaves from Angola work, where we have the most in life sentences given to people incarcerated but i'm on when you're not awake to all that you're not awake it's like you're in your own little lagoon of consciousness who the people you have lunch with what you're doing so there was a moment of waking up and it was hearing a talk where a sister talked to us and she was a sociologist and a theology professor and she made the connection for me that when jesus said blessed are you poor it didn't simply mean just suffer with Jesus on the cross and one day you're going to have a great reward in heaven. It was good news to poor people, integral to it, is it's not God's will for you to be poor. <clears throat> it's this is what this is human devising, this is human plans. And so then I got it. I mean, it was really I, the name of that chapter in River of Fire is called Lightning. Because for the first time, it was like I hooked the engine of a, of a train onto all the cars. And it was that I've got to be about justice. And I don't even know any poor people. And I moved into the inner city in the St. Thomas Housing Projects. In 19, woke up in 1980, moved to the projects in 1981. And straight out of there, being among people struggling, listening to people's stories, being moved by their suffering, your heart catches on fire. 
It's passion. It's not just intellectual thinking and reading books. And then one day coming out of the adult learning center, I got an invitation. Hey, Sister Helen, you want to write to somebody on death row? And I said, yeah, sure. I could do that. And I thought, well, you know, I'm an English major. I could write some nice letters. I had no idea that two and a half years later, that man, I was writing the letters to Patrick Sonier. I would be with him in the execution chamber when the state of Louisiana electrocuted him to death. And I'm saying to him, look at my face when they do this. And I came out of that execution chamber. Prompt, it was the middle of the night. It's all a hidden secret ritual. Threw up. Changed my life. I just went, the people are not awake to this. They all think this is a good idea. They've been made to be afraid of these people, think they're evil, got to kill them. It's my job. I've been a witness. And so I got to tell the story. And so I began. And every talk I could give in any group. And then I wrote the book, Dead Man Walking. And I'm going to tell you, Paul, if I had not had this great editor at Random House, because I'd never written a book before, who helped me shape that story, you never would have heard of that book. But Dead Man Walking came out in 93. 80% of the American public, this is a national average, supported the death penalty in 93. But I had confidence from the beginning if you, that people, the American people have good hearts. We're not vengeful people and say we got to kill these people. But remove that if I, we could get to them and if we could tell them the stories and we could bring them close, they'll get it. And we were following Thurgood Marshall's mantra, the you know, first African-American on the Supreme Court who said, the American people say they support the death penalty, but they're really ignorant of what it really is. Educate them. And, and so that's what I've been doing and still do. So you've already started to answer my next question. But as you've said, one of the lessons you've learned on your journey is that the death penalty that some good number of Americans support isn't the death penalty we actually have. Yeah, absolutely. You said it well, Paul. You so know, the, tell us a little bit about the death penalty we actually have. Yeah, let's talk about it. I'm I'm getting ready to write another book. Um and, and it's called Beneath Our Dignity, How We, the People, Are Shutting Down the Death Penalty in the United States. Here's the death penalty we actually have. The theory is, as the Supreme Court set out in Gregory, Georgia, we're only going to reserve the death penalty, not for your ordinary murders, just the worst of the worst. Nobody knows what to say and how that means. Between an ordinary murder of an individual, a universe taken away, ripped out of life through violence, and the worst of the worst. So first of all, the court set up an impossible criteria that is very fuzzy, and then it combined it, and this is this is why the thing's been bloody broken from the beginning. They combined it with complete discretion of prosecutors to seek death or not. Prosecutors never have to seek death, no matter how terrible the crime. They never have to seek it. So what happens you look at the Deep South, where prosecutors seek it all the time. You get into microcultures. You get into racism. You get into, am I running for election this year? When you put all of that down in that fulcrum of just an individual making a decision to go for death or not, it was bound to fail from the beginning. And all the mistakes, 80%. Of the wrongfully convicted people, it was because of prosecutorial misconduct. Those prosecutors deciding to go for death or not have the police report, they have the forensic evidence, they have everything in their hands, and they are supposed to turn over to defense any exonerating elements that could point to the possible innocence of the defendant. And very often, instead of doing that, they hide or they put up jailhouse snitches to back up their case. They go after winning a case and getting the political points and justice drops out completely. And wrongful people are accompanied, two of them, to execution. It's in the book, Death of Innocence. So you got politics in it. You got ignorance in it. You got racism in it, in these decisions of these prosecutors. And when you look, you look around today, most 
of the states are shutting down the death penalty. We have had an execution in Louisiana, and in the 80s, we killed eight people in eight and a half weeks. We haven't had an execution in 20 years. We're just shutting it down. There was one exception of a man who gave up his appeals, but the fire is not there to do it anymore. Now the conversation is much more about being smart on crime instead of tough on crime and throwing people away forever. So you have a general waking up, but you can find these pockets. Look at Oklahoma. You have an attorney general in Oklahoma who decided he's going to line up 20 people, 22 people to be killed. He's got it slated over the next two years to kill every every month or so or every other month, he'll kill another person. And then harken back to what our former President Trump did before he left office. He and his attorney general, William Barr, there hadn't been a federal execution in 17 years. And he lined up 13 people to be killed and they were all killed before he left office. I mean, one of the stories, Paul, just breaks your heart. It just, all of them break your heart. But one of the last people killed under Trump was Lisa Montgomery. You will never hear a story of a woman more abused. Her parents were so abusive. She was raped all the time. They even built a back room in the house that plumbers didn't have to pay a bill or electricians didn't have to pay a bill. They could go in that back room and they could rape their child. And then in that trauma and that she did a terrible crime, boom, there she is on death row. And her death sentence was supposed to be uh, set for December, but they changed it. There were some variables in the case to January. And when Lisa Montgomery was told by her lawyers, here's the, the new date of her execution in January, she kind of wistfully looked away and said, eight days. And that eight days meant it'll be eight days before Biden becomes president and he will spare my life. But I am under Trump and he is going to kill me. And she knew that was the end of her life. So look at the variables. Look at the capriciousness of this that's in this. And, uh, and we make a huge number of mistakes. There are at least 190 wrongfully convicted people lucky enough to show that that they made mistakes in their case before. Some of them, like Glenn Ford in Louisiana, was put on death row 30 years. The poor man finally gets out and he dies of cancer the next year. We make him terrible. Why? And most of it is due to prosecutorial misconduct. The other is, it's all poor people going to trial. And they have lawyers, overworked, underpaid, who can't handle the cases. And boy, I learned this with Pat Sonier. He was the first. He's the first story in Devin Walker. If you don't have a lawyer by your side, an advocate for you, all those constitutional rights you're supposed to have, a due process, a jury appears, that's just words on paper. If you don't have an actualizer by your side to make those rights really live for you. And so you got poor people, often you have inadequate defense at trial. And if you don't have a strong adversarial system during trial, it's supposed to be prosecution presents, defense presents. But if you only have strong prosecutors who are in charge of the evidence, it was bound to fail. For every eight executions we have had out of the 1,500 plus in this country, for every eight people executed, one has had to be free. That's one in eight. Can you picture taking an airplane flight where they got a little red flag up the top of your ticket, just say a little alert, you got a one in eight chance of going down in flames. That's how the death penalty system is working in the United States. So you've told us that you've observed a, a good number of executions, which most they, Americans never do. They never will either. There've been two court cases to try to make executions more public and they're all been defeated yeah what's cruel about the actual way that the death penalty is carried out in our country um so far we have a blinkered uh supreme court that can't look at that word cruel and see that to take a conscious imaginative human being and put them 
in a cell the size of a small bathroom for 25 or 30 years and then take them out at a designated time and kill them as not cruelty. The UN Convention Against Torture defines cruelty. And cruelty is either a mental or physical extreme, mental or physical assault rendered against someone who's been rendered defenseless. Extreme mental or physical. And everybody I know on death row that I've accompanied all have the same nightmare. And it is, oh, it's my time. The guards are coming in for me. They're dragging me out. I'm fighting. I'm screaming, going, no, no. And then I wake up. And I'm in my cell. It was a dream. But they're coming for me later. Because human beings with imagination anticipate consciousness and imagination. You anticipate. And so in their minds, they die a thousand times before they die. We have a blind Supreme Court. We have a bunch of privileged people who sit on that court. And as Thurgood Marshall says, when an African-American man reads those words, equal justice under law, and a white person of privilege who's gone to an elite school and reads those words, equal justice under law. For one, it's an abstract thing. For the other man, it's very concrete, lived in real experience. And how could it not be cruel? Well, the development in the Catholic Church, which has taken 1,500 years of dialogue to reach a point where in August of 2018, finally Pope Francis changed the catechism, the official teaching of the church about the death penalty, where at the first time in, in alignment with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it is this, that there is no way you can ever turn over to governments the right to decide that some human beings need to die, and you put them in charge of a process to determine that that you can never do that. And that's the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 3. There is in every human person the inalienable right to life. Inalienable means it can't be alienated or taken from you. So governments don't give human rights like the right to life to people for good behavior and they can't take it away for bad behavior. And at last, the Catholic Church is in alignment with that. And that's all because of education and dialogue within the church. I mean, when I got out there and hit the road, it was just to everybody, including to the people in my own church. Most people, especially people who who have what they need in life, you know, you're not struggling for the rent or you're not struggling against poverty. and and uh, But you don't think of these things because you're not connected to people who are in the real struggles of life. So, storytelling you get in there with people and say let me tell you what happened to me let me tell you what i learned in this and getting back to that good editor jason epstein and helped me shape the book in the beginning in the first draft i was so into the human rights of the person being executed jason said to me nobody's gonna read your book you gotta in the first 10 pages talk about the crime this person did because there is in us and our struggle on this issue, huge ambivalence. Oh my God, look what was done. Look at that child kill. Look at that mother carjack. You got to bring people into the crime and you got to feel outrage over it. Okay. It's a moral imperative to feel outrage when innocent people have been killed. And then you got to take people with you into that execution chamber. And you got to tell them all along the way, show them how the death penalty actually works. And we can be safe without imitating the murder and killing people who kill other people. So that's what you got to do. So, so, you know, not surprisingly, some of the most vocal advocates for the death penalty are the families of victims of violent crimes, as you've just suggested. So what have you learned about how death sentences affect the families of victims of crimes, of violent crimes? Oh, man, all we got to do right now is just look at Bill and Roof. Look at the Parkland murder. Look at those families brought in there and they're holding up the pictures of their child, how their child was shot, how that child was murdered. And I just feel like it's so cruel to victims' families and it's so hypocritical of prosecutors to say to them, now here's what we're going to do for you. It'll be the death of Dylan Roof that is really going to give you peace. 
And so we want you to share your suffering and we will seek the death penalty for him. And then look what happens. And the word is that one woman in particular, because jurors never have to vote for death. They, they don't even have to give the reason that they're voting not to kill a fellow human being. I mean, this is a huge moral burden put on jurors. Ordinary citizens, now you're in a room and you're going to decide whether or not you're going to kill a fellow human being. And so one woman, then two others joined her. There were three who couldn't bring themselves to say the state should kill Dylan Roof. And then look who got caught in that turmoil. Their expect I've witnessed this in closing arguments at a death penalty trial where the prosecutor is saying to the jury, look at that family sitting there. They're never going to see their child graduate from college. They're never going to see their grandchildren do justice for that family. Where the consciousness has also changed in this country has been the witnessing of victims' families standing up and saying, don't kill for me. You are going to put me in this public grief for 17, 18 years while I wait for this person to be executed. And I mean, and some of them are just, I mean, they see it. You're just re-victimizing us. And you're telling us that we're going to sit on the front row and watch as you kill the one who killed our loved one. Are we going to watch that violence? And that's supposed to heal us? It's such a ruse. It's such a, a political manipulation of victims' families. And I met more and more of them. I just went to Oklahoma City and I stayed with Bud Welch and his wife, Lois. Bud lost his daughter, Julie, in the Oklahoma City violence. He was the first one to figure out, I'm not going to get anything from watching Timothy McVeigh. I'm, I'm watching closed circuit television. I'm going to watch as the state kills him. My journey is I got to deal with the loss of Julie. I got to be able to deal with that as we do with the death of anybody in our family. And it's just such a fake thing. It's so unreal. Because he could see what was happening to him. But said, I was smoking five packages of cigarettes a day. I'm self-medicating with alcohol. I'm dying, waiting to see this guy because I was so filled with anger. The journey toward peace of those who have lost their loved ones is certainly not to wait for the state to kill the one who killed their loved one and they get to witness it. So we, it's our victims' families themselves who are speaking out more and more about why the death penalty doesn't do anything, could never heal them. So the the, the um, sentence for the Parkland shooter of life imprisonment created a lot of um, controversy in the press and, you know, on the in the yelling television shows. Um, you've already started to explain this, but talk about the power of mercy. Why is mercy such an important value in regards to this to this challenge of the death penalty and mass incarceration in the United States? Yeah, we're calling it, we call it mercy. Of course it is mercy. I mean, in each of those jurors, also one of the things that's happening is with good defense getting in there, it's happened in Virginia, which is why Virginia could abolish the death penalty. They started getting good defense and part of good defense is to talk during the voir dire to the jurors and just say, you have a decision to make, and mercy is always within your reach. You do not have to make a decision to kill a fellow human being. And what is mercy but the recognition of the deep humanness in another human being that is in me, and that everybody's worth more than the worst thing they've ever done in their life. And so mercy simply means I will not apply to you the, the stringencies of absolute law to take away your life because I respect that you have an inviolable dignity in you. You're worth more than the worst thing you've ever done. And I will not play God in your life and decide that your life needs to be finished and you need to be killed. It's also a, it's humility, basically, of one human being toward another human being. Who am I to say? that your life absolutely should end. If I put myself, I mean, one of the things that happened, and this is good defense getting in there, for uh, Dylan Roof was fetal alcohol syndrome. 
when the jury heard about fetal alcohol, what is the fetal alcohol syndrome do? It messes up your brain. You're not making a clear, conscious, evil decision to go kill people. You are out of control in your own mind and you got to go to maybe even perceive all these children in the school as your enemy and they got violent. Who knows? But human beings are extremely complex. We're more than complex. We're mysteries. And they found out that he had fetal alcohol syndrome. And so that is what you call a mitigating or call it a merciful circumstance, which said, we, and we will not choose to kill him. So you've just talked about Dylan Roof, who presumably was guilty of the crime for which he was sentenced to life in prison. But from your work, what percentage or how many innocent people are executed in the United States? People who did not, in fact, commit the violent crime that they're accused of. Well, I mean, when you just look at the ones who have surfaced lucky enough to show they were wrongfully convicted. Uh, I mean, that's 190 and counting. I'm with my seventh person on death row now, a company, and uh, three of the seven have been innocent. Three of the seven. That, that's just, you know, I don't take people as their spiritual advisor, you know, if they're guilty or they're not, they're human beings. And even if they are guilty, you know, they, they are not deserving of death and the cruelty of that death. But, I mean, that's just my experience concretely, but look at it. And when you look at the way the broken system, which was never going to work, it was ill-conceived to think that you could set up the ultimate thing of death with such a fuzzy criteria of the worst of the worst, which, and then couple it with this complete discretion of prosecutors. Is anybody really surprised that 75% of the actual executions have happened in the deep south states that practice slavery. I mean, we have all, always been color-coded by race. Overwhelmingly, it's when white people are killed that the death penalty, and roughly eight in every 10 people sitting on death row or 75% of people on death row, it's because they kill white people. And look at that discretion from the beginning. So when black people are killed, where's the outrage over the death? Where's the care about that victim? Where's the ongoing stories on TV about the young black kid that was killed? It's always when you see those ongoing things on TV, it's going to be a white, usually a woman, that's been killed and you follow the story and get the serial killer or whatever. I can't handle the Mormon thing. I need to shut it down. So we're just at the almost at the end of our time, Sister Helen. What message will you be bringing to the University of Oregon community when you come next week? I'm going to be telling them stories. I'm going to just say, let me bring you where I've been. I I once accepted the death penalty. I didn't think about it. It was Catholic teaching uh, that thou shalt not kill did not apply to the death penalty because you needed to protect society from violent people. What did I know? And when you take people with you in your own journey, and especially young people, well, I want to get to the young people because they got to understand about human rights. And they're the ones. And I love the University of Oregon. This would be like the fifth time maybe I've been there. And uh, so I want to take them with me through my experiences. And then we got a grant to put books in people's hands. And so when they're going to leave my talk, they're going to have in their hands either dead man walking or death and innocence. So if you can hear stories and then you can read reading is a very reflective imaginative process you're quiet you're not debating with anybody you're getting into the pages of it and you're descending into these experiences and you're learning uh the things you know that i certainly never knew so that's what the message is it's like we need to be a people of life pro-life truly means across the board pro-life of all human beings, not just innocent life, but guilty life as well. Well, Sister Helen, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been such a pleasure. It's always such an inspiration to listen to your stories and to hear, hear your journey. It's been a huge pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you, Paul. Wouldn't have been the same without you. You asked all the good questions. I've been speaking with Sister Helen Prejean, founder of the Ministry Against the Death Penalty. 
on October 27th, 2022. Sister Helen will give a talk at the University of Oregon as a guest of the Prison Education Program. Thanks so much for watching.